and if we have a quorum, then um, Patty can start the meeting at five o'clock. Okay. For those of you just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members of the public wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you'll only hear the Spanish translation. Marina, can you please restate that in Spanish? Sure. Para los miembros del público que desean escuchar esta reunión en español, eh, pueden acces acceder a la característica de interpretación uh, haciéndole clic al globito que está en la parte de abajo de la pantalla y escogiendo español. Eh, una vez que escojan español, eh, les recomendamos que quiten el audio principal para escucharlo únicamente en español. Gracias. Thank you, Marina. I'm going to go ahead and move you over into the Spanish channel along with Paloma. Uh, Paloma and Marina are our interpreters for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, Paloma, if you can commence translation um, as the meeting starts uh, at the top of the order when uh, Chair Cisco calls the meeting. Um, Stephanie, it looks to me like we have a quorum. Am I correct on that? You're correct. Okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, and begin the meeting then. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and open tonight's meeting of the Charter Review Committee and ask for roll call, please. Thank you. Committee Member Weeks. Here. Member Walsh? Here. Member Villalobos? Here. Member Pitts? Here. Member oh, thank you. Member Oliveras? Here. Member Miner? Here. Member Miller? Member Mazia? Here. Member Martinez? Member Lean. Member Close. Here. Member Gudinho. Member Diaz. Here. Member Cunningham. Here. Member Condren. Here. Member Byrne. Here. Member Bartley. Member Badenfort. Here. Member Barber. Here. Member Arizon. And Chair Cisco. I am here. Let me just circle back really quick. Member Miller, sure. have, you, have you joined us? Member Martinez, have you joined us? Member Ling, have you joined us? Member Gudinho, have you joined us? Member Bartley, have you joined us? Member Arizon, have you joined us? See her. But I don't know if she can mute herself. Can you hear us, Member Arizon? 
I see her present, so I'll mark her present, and I think she's having some technical difficulties with her audio. So let the record show that all committee members are present with the exception of committee member Bartley, committee member Gudino, committee member Ling, committee member Martinez, and committee member Miller. Great, right, thank you. And, and do you wanna do some of the um, housekeeping matters, Stephanie? Thank you. So committee members, please keep your audio on mute unless you are speaking so we don't pick up any background noise. Also, as members of the public join the meeting via Zoom, they will be participating as an attendee. Your microphone and camera will be muted. If you are calling in from a telephone and choose to speak during public comments portion of today's agenda, for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone number to resident and the last four digits of your phone number. The city of Santa Rosa is committed to creating a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption. We will not tolerate any hateful speech or actions and are well staffed to monitor that everyone is participating respectfully or they will be removed. If necessary, we will also immediately end the meeting. Public comments will be heard after each agenda item is presented. And after each agenda item is presented, Chair Cisco will ask for committee member comments and then open it up for public comment. If you are participating from Zoom or by telephone and wish to make a live public comment on a specific item at the time public comment is opened by Chair Cisco, please use the raise hand feature. If you are calling in via telephone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. Throughout today's agenda, when Chair Cisco calls for public comment, an interpreter will be prepared to assist anyone needing interpretation services. Those using interpreter support will be afforded additional time for public comment as required by the Brown Act. We ask those listening on the Spanish channel but wishing to make a public comment to please turn off interpretation channel entirely at the time you hear your name called so you can join the main channel to make your public comment heard and translated into English. This icon may now look like a circle with an ES in the middle and the word Spanish underneath. You can then rejoin the Spanish channel at the conclusion of your comment to continue listening to the meeting in Spanish. Thank you, Chair Cisco. Thank you. Um, okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to item number two, which is public comments on non-agenda matters, which is a time for any member of the public to address the committee on matters of interest to the committee that are not listed tonight uh, on our agenda items. So with that, I will go ahead and um, open that uh, public comment period and uh, check with our uh, host to see if there's anyone waiting to speak. If you're participating by Zoom, uh, use the raised hand feature. If you're calling in, you need to dial star nine and you'll be recognized by our host. Chair Cisco, I'm not seeing any hands be raised via Zoom for public comment on this item. Okay, great. So with that, then I'll go ahead and close the public comment uh, period and uh, we'll move on to the approval of our minutes. Uh, we have two sets of minutes tonight. Um, so we'll begin with our uh, January 19th uh, meeting minutes. Any comments, corrections on that set? Okay, not seeing any, those will stand as printed. Uh, next set is our February 2nd uh, uh, regular meeting and any comments or corrections on those? I have a correction. Okay. Um, Who is I that? Was, this is Yvette. I was here okay. on that day. I, I was present. Okay. okay. Okay, I would like to, uh, I think I note that you, you joined the meeting later in the initial um, uh, roll call, it has you absent, but I noted when you joined the meeting. So my minutes reflect how I take the roll call at the beginning. Got it. 
Thanks, Yvette. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our scheduled items. The first one is a standing item, 4.1, our equity principles. Uh, no presentation on that tonight. Any uh, comments or additions or corrections to um, our principles document? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So this um, also is a matter that the public can comment on. So I will go ahead and open uh, the opportunity for the public to comment on equity principles. Again, if you are uh, participating by Zoom, use your raised hand feature. If you're dialing in uh, by telephone, use the star nine feature. And I will uh, check with the host to see if there's anyone waiting to speak on this item. Hi, Chair Cisco. I do not see any hands being raised via Zoom for public comment on item 4.1. Okay, thank you. So, okay, so we'll close that public comment period and move on to our uh, main item this evening, which is 4.2 on ranked choice voting. Um, Sue Gallagher and, is, and Rob Jackson are staff, and I believe we'll have a presentation by Eva Proto. Um, Sue, do you want to make any comments before we uh, turn it over to Ms. Proto? No, I, uh, we can go ahead and start with her presentation. She'll give us a general overview of ranked choice voting. Um, okay. I prepare um, a second PowerPoint um, with some uh, just data from the San Francisco Bay Area ranked choice uh, voting elections. Um, we can address that separately, but this is where we start. So I will hand it over to Ms. Proto. Okay. Thank well, I definitely want to welcome you, Ms. Proto, and appreciate your time tonight uh, in making this presentation. So thank you. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Um, so I am Diva Marie Proto, and I am the Clerk, Recorder, Assessor, Registrar of Voters. And as part of that, I conduct the elections um, for the County of Sonoma, and then the City of Santa Rosa contracts with us to conduct all of their elections. Um, next slide, please. So ranked choice voting is a system um, that has become more popular of late. Uh, we've seen it in a number of jurisdictions, and it is where voters rank the candidates by preference. So generally, we'll, we'll see three to seven to ten different ranks. Um, in California, it is only allowed to be used in charter cities or counties. So Sonoma County as an entity cannot use it. Uh, Santa Rosa and Petaluma are the only ones legally authorized to. Um, there's two different types of ranked choice voting uh, that we have available to us. There's a single transferable vote um, where you have a contest with multiple potential winners. This is what we would have had in Santa Rosa had it not gone to district elections. So when we had um, previous elections, it was a vote for three or a vote for four. Um, now with the districts, it's a vote for one, so it would be the instant runoff voting, um, which is used for a single seat election. Next slide, please. So in, um, when you're looking at the ballot, the voters are going to choose the candidate they like the most. Um, they're going to rank that person as number one, and then they have the option to make additional selections in case the person that they selected as their first pick doesn't win. So they still get a voice in um, the contest. Uh, voters do not have to vote every rank. Um, sometimes they only support one candidate and they all will just vote rank one or rank two. Uh, the first round, the first choice vote is always going to be counted. And then second or third choices are only going to be counted if an earlier choice has been eliminated. Um, if a voter selects the same candidate for more than one rank, the vote for that choice will count only once. Um, it will not count in future iterations. Um, next slide, we have um, a, an example. This is the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico. 
Um, this one has English Spanish on it. We are a bilingual county now. So all of our ballots will have both English and Spanish um, instructions on them. And you can see um, in this option, there are um, five ranks in this particular case uh, that may have been because there are five candidates uh, with the instructions up above. Um, next slide is uh, San Francisco's ballot. Um, they don't have Spanish, they have, uh, this one's a different language, um, but they have up to seven rankings and um, they have a little bit uh, more instructions up there um, as well as some visuals, which make it a little bit easier um, for people to understand. Um, next slide. So with rank choice voting, uh, when we come to the tabulation process, we will count all the first choice um, ranks. If any candidate receives a majority of the first choices, the contest is over, they are the winner. Um, the rank choice voting comes in if nobody receives at least 50% plus one of those first choice votes. So whoever received the fewest number of first choice ranks is eliminated. Um, the ballots with that candidate as their first choice, then we go down to the second choice. We recalculate all the votes. And then again, if any candidate hits that 50% plus one threshold, it's over. Otherwise we go on to the next uh, step where we'd look at the person who has the fewest votes at that point. Um, on the next slide, um, it's basically the same information. Um, it's just a little bit more of a visual to help people. So um, in that uh, top orange corner, um, that first round, if somebody hits that 50% threshold, that's over, that candidate wins. Um, if nobody has hit that 50% threshold, then we're going to go to a round two. Um, so in this example, um, the third option that got 12%, that person would be eliminated from the ranking and their choices were, whoever they had put as their second choice would be added to the first choice of the other candidates. So in this particular case on top, you would see that um, the fourth candidate got 45% of the vote and then they were given 6% of the eliminated candidates votes. So that hit the 51% threshold. Um, on the bottom, again, if those um, numbers did not push anybody above 50%, then we would go on to round number three. So, next slide, please. Um, so I was asked about costs. I reached out to our vendor. The current estimate is uh, $350,000 for the initial implementation and then a $70,000 annual fee. Um, that cost would be paid by the city because at this point they are the only ones um, that would be implementing uh, ranked choice voting. If Petaluma also opted, then that cost would be shared. Uh, there would be additional printing and ballot design costs, as you saw on um, some of the previous slides. Some of that ballot space uh, is larger because it's going to take up additional co columns. So that may not be in the same location on the ballot. Um, it has to take up several spaces. And most likely it would be a separate ballot page due to the requirements of the instructions um, and then just the space it takes up. There would also be additional education materials that we'd have to create and put in the voter information guide, um, perhaps work with the city on um, some public service announcements and everything like that. And then there would be additional time for uh, our staff to do the manual tally. So um, after every election we do go through, um, we do a 1% manual tally. Um, and then there's an option now for us to do a risk limiting audit. So that would mean that we would have to do multiple rounds for the city elections. Um, the city ultimately would pay the actual cost for each election as they do now. Next slide. 
so the current estimates that we provide for a standalone election um, for a citywide, it's just over 100,000 voters. So we would generally quote $2.50 to $4.50 per voter. Um, with smaller contests, that goes up because you don't have the same um, price savings with uh, large scale purchases. So we would quote $3 to $6 per voter. Um, that would depend on which district it was in because right now we have a very large range um, and those um, district numbers will be changing with redistricting. So with consolidated elections, uh, the cost is lower because you're splitting the, um, the cost of the ballot of the voter information guide, the postage. Um, so we would generally say $2 to 550 per voter. And then if you were adding on additional measures, it would be 150 to $4. Right now, um, ranked choice voting, we're estimating that it would add $1 to $3 per voter increase per election. That would be revised based on experience. So next slide. Um, and then just to give a little bit of information about what goes in to um, the costs, um, ballot printing costs right now, especially there is a paper shortage. Um, and so the costs are increasing substantially. Uh, the same thing for the voter information guides. Uh, we also do all the layout, um, the typesetting design, um, multiple rounds of proofing. Uh, we have to pay for the printing. There's different versions for every ballot type. So if you are in Santa Rosa District 1, you are going to get a different voter information guide than Santa Rosa District 7, as well as Petaluma is going to get one unincorporated. Um, Sonoma County is going to get one. A, somebody in a separate fire district is going to get one. Um, postage, we do pay for um, mailing out all the ballots and voter information guides, as well as return service on them. So ballots cannot be forwarded. Those will come back to our office and we do have to pay the postage on that. Um, it, the larger the ballot is, the more ballot cards we get, that increases the postage. Um, we also have a requirement to send ballots to military and overseas voters prior to the ballots going out um, to the general population. So those are prepared and sent, sent separately by our office. Uh, we have to, at a minimum, send those 45 days before the election. Um, the cost will also depend on how many ranking levels were included. Um, the more ranks, uh, the larger the ballot space is going to be, the larger it may take us to go through rounds with the 1% manual tally. And then of course, um, whatever we decide to do in terms of educational materials, um, if we're doing postcards, there's different costs based on size, how often um, are we going to do things every election, um, just once, kind of depends on uh, what the city would want to do with that. And next slide. And then just um, making sure everybody's aware, um, in 2021, they did pass uh, a permanent bill that mandated that all active registered voters be sent a ballot in the mail for all future elections. So that does increase postage um, a little bit from what we had previously. Uh, we are transitioning to the Voters' Choice Act election model, so there's not going to be the assigned neighborhood polling places. Uh, for our current numbers, we're going to have seven vote centers that are open for 11 days. So starting the Saturday before the Saturday before election day. And th that will be open um, a minimum of eight hours per day. And then starting the Saturday before the election, we will have 24 more locations open up in the county. Voters can vote in person at any location. This is very important, especially right now with um, the multiple disasters we've been having, so that if one area is affected, those voters are not disenfranchised, they will be able to vote at any other location in the county. Um, we also have uh, ballot drop boxes. Most of them are installed, uh, but our current numbers require 21 locations around the county. And we do like to remind people those are picked up by our staff 
frequently so they're not just sitting in there. Um, and then, of course, uh, we are looking for vote centers. So if anybody knows of locations uh, that would be good, please let us know. Uh, Santa Rosa is one of our harder cities uh, to get locations. So we have most of our locations for June. I'm hoping for one or two uh, more in Santa Rosa. So uh, next slide. I think that's probably it. Yep. And then my contact information in case anybody has any questions. Great, thank, thank you so much. Um, committee members, uh, this is a, a time for, uh, for you to ask questions of Ms. Proto um, and or of staff. Um, when we get our questions uh, completed, I'll go ahead and open it for public comment. And then after that is done, I'll bring it back for our discussion and uh, off offering our opinions. So um, any questions right now? And could you use the raised hand feature so I know who's talking? <laughs> okay, great. Um, Karen. Hi, Diva. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and I do have a couple questions. Um, who would you said that probably if we went to rank choice voting that the city and the county would do the education uh, to the community together um, has there been any thought about that how that would work who would take the lead on that um, or is it way too early because we haven't made the decision um, at this point I think it would probably be too early my guess is that we would work um, with the city to kind of get a rough sketch of everything, what information, when, what is the city willing to pay for, um, and, and what information does the city really want out there, timing. Um, ultimately, we're the ones that have the voter information, so likely we would be doing um, the actual mailings. Um, and then we have people in our office who currently work on drafting um, postcards to voters and information. Um, so we have some of that infrastructure set up, but we'd probably want to have a longer discussion about that. Thank you. And I have just two more quick questions. Um, uh, you said that there would uh, be additional time for the count to do the manual tally. Do you have any idea how, what time frame you're looking at? No, um, it depends on the contests, how many rounds there are. Um, so it's very dependent on the actual race. And then um, Petaluma could, would possibly could do ranked choice voting too. They're the only other community. Have they talked to you at all about that? Or do you know if they're talking about that? I believe they're possibly interested. Um, they've asked a couple of questions. Um, but not to this point where um, I've been asked to speak to anybody. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, um, Brian. Thanks, Diva, for giving us some time tonight. Uh, I'm getting a little confused on the math. Uh, so you mentioned the three to six per voter per district, basically, and the $70,000 annual costs. Um, would that three to six be if we did a, um, to me, the alternative is a primary system. So we have a primary election, then a secondary if necessary, um, or a general and a follow-up. I don't know how you call that, but would that be the three to six per di dollars per district if we had a follow-up election? Is that what that would be? I'm just looking for some clarity. I don't even know if my question makes sense. We have, um, so the 350,000 was uh, specific to the uh, implementation of the system software that would be required. Um, we quote the elections on a per election um, per voter basis. So the three to six dollars would be for um, an election in a district. So if you had a council member uh, currently where you were going to do an election, um, if so for instance, for November, um, because we know we have four um, contests on the ballot, that's going to be a certain price. If the city of Santa Rosa adds on a measure, that's going to be a different price because there's an additional cost to it. Um, so it's the cost is variable depending on the actual situation, how many voters there are, um, and what's shared. One of the reasons, um, generally speaking, uh, the costs come in on the low side or under 
Um, that tends to be because of the state uh, costs come in higher. Um, we are kind of quoting um, basically worst case scenario when we are giving you a quote because we have no idea how many state propositions might go on and every state proposition that goes on is gonna be shared ballot space. And so that's going to be a reduction in the cost to the city. Let me try to ask it another way then. So if we, if we did our November primary, but we had a runoff, if there was not a 50%, how much would that second election cost just for the one district? It would be the same as the cost for one district. It would be the quote three to $6 per voter. Um, currently, uh, the city has um, everything in November. So it's not necessarily a 50%. I believe it is whoever gets the most um, will win. Um, Great. Thank you. Chris. Yes. Thank you, Eva. Um, I have three questions. I don't know if these are for you or Sue Gallagher or for now or later in the meeting or, or never, but um, uh, three questions would be, number one, is there any uh, accepted wisdom in terms of what type of runoff avoidance system most accurately or faithfully represents the will of the voters? That's one question. Okay. Secondly, I've heard of or seen positional voting, which is used by a lot of organizations or sports and so on, where you say, first place is three, second place is two, third is one. And I'm wondering, uh, logistically, is that something that we could do, you know, uh, leaving aside all the other issues? And then third, is there any experience or comments on what type of runoff avoidance model most faithfully opens the field to diverse, qualified candidates who wouldn't be otherwise disincentivized because of a runoff, a second election. So there you go. Um, I think for one and three, um, I don't know if Sue has information about research. Um, I don't really have good information about um, what's best. Um, we've never done it here. So um, I'm not aware of studies or anything like that that have been done. Um, on the second question with, um, are there alternate ways? Um, this is the way that our election vendor and I believe the other election vendors um, in the state uh, have available. Um, I'm not sure if there's options um, to work with the vendor to um, design a new method, uh, methodology for doing it, but that would be a question more towards the vendor to see if that is something um, and I'm not sure the systems have to be certified through the Secretary of State. So I'm not sure if that might also be a Secretary of State question. Um, statewide, we can't use rank choice voting, but they still certify the systems. So I don't know if, if they have a, a say in that at all. Great. And, and okay. And then Sue, do you have anything um, to add on uh, Chris's First and third question, uh, runoff avoidance questions. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I did prepare a, a PowerPoint with just some data from the Bay Area. It may not get exactly at Chris's question, um, but it will uh, indicate kind of what, what the results have been of juris some jurisdictions that, have, that are using the ranked choice voting and how that has played out. Um, I did not include, I did uh, on a separate sheet uh, include information about uh, race and gender, uh, but I did not include that in the PowerPoint. Again, trying to just keep things uh, uh, shorter. Um, but I can, it, it was also hard to make any judgments from that, um, given that I, I only looked at 2020, 2020 election and 2018 election. So I don't have a historical perspective of whether, you know, whether the adoption and use of ranked choice voting had in fact increased the number of, of uh, uh, minority candidates or minority members. So. But I thought we'd go through all of these questions for DIVA and then once um, 
uh, and then that I would present the data. Okay, um, Ron. Um, okay, hi, Ron Miller. I have two questions. If I understand correctly, if the, in the first round, if somebody gets 48%, that's the highest. And when you move to the next round, those votes in the first round are not, are, are ignored. They're not added to the second round, right? The first choice of all the candidates still remaining in the race are still counted. So that 48% would still hold because that candidate's still in the race. Um, what's added to it would be whoever came in last, those, um, all the second choice votes um, that, that um, the people who had voted for the eliminated contest number one or candidate to be number one, it would go to their second choice. So it would take all those second choices and add it to the original 48%. Um, and when somebody is eliminated and the, after, you know, during the first round, somebody is eliminated, their votes are counted in the second round. Are they also counted in the other rounds? Yes, if, um, so if somebody had voted for candidate one uh, for rank number one, candidate two for rank number two, and candidate three for rank number three, um, we do the tally, um, candidate one comes in last. So they would take, um, so they would go to um, their rank number two, which would be candidate two. Um, and so that would be added to candidate two. On the third choice or on the third rank, um, if candidate two was the next person eliminated, then it would go to their third choice and, and pick that one. But if uh, candidate two stayed in the mix, we'd never go and look at the rank number three or rank number four, because that's only going to be calculated if somebody's eliminated. And then we'll immediately take everybody, all the votes cast for the eliminated person and redistribute them um, based on what round it is. Thank you. Yvette. So my question is about the um, estimated um, cost of implementation. Uh, so I heard you said that if another um, city come on board, there will be that 70, um, 70,000 annual fee that will be split among whatever entities. So for the 350, is that a cost that each um, city would uh, have to pay for the implementation? Or is that a cost that just Santa Rosa, if we was to move to that, we would have to pay that, but then everybody else would benefit from that? Um, the $350,000 is specifically for the software and setup from our vendor. So it's a one-time cost. Um, if Santa Rosa was moving forward alone, they would have to take that cost. Um, it may be something that could be talked about if Petaluma was interested a couple years later. Um, there might be conversation about that where, you know, hey, in order to use this, Santa Rosa already paid for it. Um, you know, you so, need yeah, that, that kind of concerns me a little bit because you know, this is a process that we're doing here in Santa Rosa, but maybe a year or two later, we'll have other entities that's doing that, but then we pay for the cost for the system, but then yet we don't, it benefits us, but it's also going to benefit other people. So is there something that could be put in place if we ever choose to do this, that if other people come on down the line, that there be maybe some type of kickback to the originator of the cost, because that wouldn't be fair. You know, people could be like, Oh, they have the money. Let them do it. We'll jump on later. <laughs> and so, so is there something that we can put in place that if if we was to move to that system, that you know Santa Rosa gets some kind of kickback from the other entities, you know, for the implementation of their process as well? Um, I think that's a very good point. Um, so we currently the county um, because we administer the elections, we currently have contracts with the different cities. Um, so 
uh, individual contracts. Um, and so it may be that um, when the city attorneys are talking about doing the contract because we'll have to rewrite it if we move to ranked choice voting. Um, it may be that that's something that we could put in to the contract that uh, Santa Rosa is paying the implementation fees if other entities want to use it. There's um, a reimbursement um, back to the city or something like that um, that maybe would address that. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't say for sure. Um, but uh, I'm sure there is something, um, especially if that's something um, that's noted um, in terms of the county, we're not getting any of the fee. So we don't have any, uh, we're not trying to get 350 from Santa Rosa and 350 from Petaluma or anything like that. So. So, so that I guess that would be a question for Sue going forward. If we were to do this process, could that be something that is written into the contract that anybody thereafter, you know, do a little, you know, I don't know how many years, five years, 10 years until we maybe recoup our costs or a, half of that cost or something like that. Is that something the city lawyer can put into play? Well, we could try, um, but those contracts, that kind of term would have to be agreed to by the other cities. Uh, and I'm not sure that we would be able to get that agreement uh, up front at this point. Uh, if there was a city, if Petaluma, for example, was deciding to implement in two years or three years or four years, maybe they would be willing to do that, but it would be voluntary. There's, we're not able to compel, um, compel that reimbursement. Okay, thank you. Logan. Thanks, Patty. Diva, good to see you and thank you for your time tonight. Um, so, you it said it can take a little bit longer to count the ballots. Um, do you, so you said maybe like a few more days. Is it possible it also could take less time? I mean, hypothetically, if you had like a rank choice election where one candidate gets, you know, 90% of rank one, would that be easier to count than like a, the current system where you would get a similar result or would it just be the same counting process? It would be the same counting process. In terms of the computer tabulation, um, there's not going to be any extra time um, because it's computer-based. We have the formulas written in there um, and we would be able to run it um, for each one, but we could also get a result very quickly. Um, the results will take longer to be known um, because when we put things out on election night, at that point in time, we're going to give everybody, we will not eliminate anybody. Where currently, if you just have one election, you can say, okay, well, this person right now is running at 45%, this person's at 30, this person's at 12. So even though the election is not finished, the registrar voters may still have, you know, 40% of the ballots still to count, but statistically speaking, this person is winning. Um, and you can, the media and other people can call the election, that would not be the case with ranked choice voting because we would not be able to run those eliminations until we had processed, signature checked and scanned all the ballots that were going to be counted. Um, but that would not take um, longer. What would take longer is simply our staff time to do the 1% manual tally because each rank is going to be its own um, contest for lack of a better word. Okay, that makes and sense. Um, it's not like days for each contest or anything like that, um, but it would be um, more than it is currently. Okay, and do you know of any research or data on um, two questions I have? Do you see before and after rank choice any increase or decrease in voter turnout? And then do you see any increase or decrease in campaign spending? Do you know if there's any of that? Do you have any of that data available or do you know? I don't have any of that data. I don't know if Sue does. Um, I know that we already have a very high percentage of turnout, um, but if it could push us higher, you know, that's always good. Okay. And then this is sort of maybe more of an opinion question. Um, do people, do other registrars talk about this issue? Is this something that folks see growing or is it like being discussed at conferences? 
you know, have you ever talked to the registrar from San Francisco who's done it for a while? Um, just any thoughts you've heard from other jurisdictions, I'd appreciate it. Um, not, we don't talk very much about it. Every once in a while, it'll come up um, generally because somebody else will be implementing and they have questions. Um, but for the most part, uh, there's not that many jurisdictions um, that do it. And um, so those are kind of done on a side basis. So not necessarily talking at conferences, but I did reach out to the city of San Francisco, um, Alameda County to talk about, you know, what systems do they use? What do their ballots look like? What are the, those types of things? Um, generally speaking, it fits within our current processes. Um, so it's not a huge change. It's simply a difference. Okay. Great, you've been very helpful, thank you. And I think Sue might have a response on that. Oh, I was just gonna indicate that, that um, there are some articles that talk about um, voter turnout uh, under ranked choice voting. I haven't seen any articles that are coming to my mind regarding campaign contributions. Um, I did not have a chance to really delve into that. Uh, if we want, if we end up going further, you know, I'm happy to um, to, to look at some of those numbers as well. Was that in what uh, was in our agenda, Sue? The stuff on turnout? I didn't see that in any of the studies. Maybe I missed it. No, I don't think it wasn't in any. Those were some separate articles or separate um, clips. Um, uh, so I don't, you know, I don't have it right now. I could find it. Um, if you have it handy, that would be, I think that'd be useful for our next discussion, if you can sure. find it. Sure. Thanks. Mark. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patty. And Diva, thank you very much for the presentation. It's helpful. Um, I had one technical question. On the instructions to voters, it says, do not fill in more than one oval in a column. And it also says, do not fill in more than one oval for a candidate. Um, so I'm assuming if they did fill in one, so I, I'm not sure what would happen if they if a voter was to vote for it, say in this example, uh, Peter Ives as their option number one, their first choice, and then also voted for Peter Ives again as their second choice or third choice. Would their first choice ballot count, or would the whole ballot be spoiled? The first choice would count. It would be the other options that would not count because that person would have been eliminated. And so there's nothing for that vote to be attributed to. Right. Um, on the other side of that, if somebody voted for multiple people, if it was a vote for one and you voted for multiple people in a column, that would be considered an overvote and neither um, candidate would, it would be counted for either one, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, one more question, if, if you had a information on this or, or an inkling of, of how this would go, how often does a number one vote getter in the first pass not also receive, uh, not also eventually win? So the number one vote getter that did get 50%, how often do they not win? I don't have any statistics on that. I know there's been a couple of articles over the last couple of years, I think more on the East Coast and everything like that, where um, it, it's been a surprise. It has come down to, um, you know, four choices in and the person was not the first selected. But that's anecdotal. Those are um, articles I remember seeing. I don't have any statistics on how often that happens or anything. Okay, thank, and thank I, you very much. I do have some of that information uh, when we get to my presentation. Okay, thank you, sir. Scott. Just a, a couple, one, uh, again, uh, thanks Diva for the presentation. Um, if somebody, and this is just to make sure it's clear, um, if somebody votes for the, the makes the first round choice a number one, but they didn't vote the second, third, their first um, was eliminated, you know, they're eliminated, then their vote's just gone. They've basically given up any other chance at voting, correct? Correct. Okay. And then and then the other one, I know there is um, Chris made a reference to 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 runoffs and and 
and Brian about, you know, primary and whatever in Santa Rosa right now, um, the most votes in one round is elected. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, really, thank you again, Ms. Proto. This is just so great that you, you're willing to spend this time. And uh, it's kind of a complex system. <laughs> you're helping us wrap our minds around it. Um, any other questions for Ms. Proto before we move on to letting Sue do her presentation? Not seeing any. So again, thank you. All right. Um, did you need me to stay on longer or am I fine for now? And then if there's any other questions that come up, I'm happy to answer those later. Yeah, and I'm, 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 I want to express my appreciation again, and I know the appreciation of the full committee for your time. Um, and I really leave that to you. You're welcome to stay and, and hear the discussion in case there are other questions that come up. Um, but we also know that you are a very busy person and <laughs> holds you here. Um, so I, I leave that choice to you. Well, thank you. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to come. Great. Thank you. So if you want to put up the, oh, there we go, PowerPoint. Um, so what I did, um, what questions were coming to my mind as I was um, looking at uh, the different articles and looking at all the information was, well, how does this actually, how has this actually played out um, and how might it play out in Santa Rosa? So um, next slide. There are currently four jurisdictions in the Bay Area that use ranked choice voting. Um, San Francisco has been using it the longest since 2004. Uh, Berkeley, San Leandro, and Oakland have been using it since 2010. Uh, next slide. Uh, I want to let you know that all of the information um, on the following slides um, I uh, pulled from datainnovation.org. Um, the link is right there if you want to look at it yourself. Um, they are very comprehensive. Um, that link leads you to results from across the country. Um, but it also includes, of course, um, these four jurisdictions, and it includes a number of, you know, it does let you know um, uh, for each race, um, you know, how many people were running, whether they were incumbents, challengers, whether it was an open seat, uh, does indicate uh, the race and gender of each uh, candidate. And then it gives the actual voting numbers in round one and however many rounds uh, it took, um, uh, it lists all that information. So a, a great resource. Um, next slide. So Berkeley 2022, I'm not gonna go through each individual um, uh, uh, election. Um, so on each of these slides, you can take a look at it, but I'll just give you kind of the summary uh, look at it. Um, this was five different elections. Uh, four of them were determined uh, in the first round. I will note that all of the elections had more than two candidates. If there's only two candidates, then it never goes to us to, to, to further rounds. Um, so four of these five were determined in the first round and one was determined in the fourth round. That one that was determined in the fourth round, uh, the winner had led in each of the four rounds. Uh, so there was no change in the outcome from the first round to the fourth round, other than that the winner had at that point received uh, more than 50% of the vote. Next slide. We go to Berkeley 2018. Similarly, five elections. Uh, in this uh, set, there was one, this election for city auditor that only had the two candidates. Um, so that was of course determined in the first round. Uh, one, was, one election was determined in the third round. And once again, in that case, uh, the winner had led in all of the three rounds. Um, so again, uh, same at the first round and same at the third round, except for uh, had gone up to the 50% threshold. San Leandro, oh, next slide. 
San Leandro 2020. Uh, three elections, uh, one had just the two candidates, all three were determined in the first round, so never went to any second round. S next slide. San Leandro 2018, four elections. Uh, there were two of those elections that had only two candidates, so of course those were determined in the first round. The other two elections were also uh, determined in the first round. So no, uh, never went on to the further rounds um, uh, that would uh, be entailed in ranked choice voting. Next slide. Oakland uh, 2020, and this has two slides because it's both for the, um, for, for council and for uh, school board and also for city attorney. Um, so uh, in this first page, uh, two, two were, three were, in, were uh, decided in round one, uh, one in round three, one in round four, round on, one in round five. Um, next slide, because I'll give the summary at the end of the next slide. Again, four additional races in 2020 in Oakland. Um, uh, all of these went on to multiple rounds. So the total of the 10 elections in Oakland in 2020, three were determined in the first round, two were determined in the third round, two in the fourth round and three in the fifth round. And in all of those uh, cases of the third, fourth and fifth round, um, the elected candidate had led in all of the rounds. Um, so again, uh, no change from the first um, first round through to the to the to the final vote. In San Francisco, next slide. San Francisco in 2020. Um, this is where it starts getting a little bit more interesting. Um, five elections. Um, there were multiple candidates, more than two candidates in all elections. Um, two elections were decided in round one. Uh, one in round three and two in round six, but the supervisor in district seven in that one, that was the only one that we've seen so far where uh, it was a different candidate that won at the end of the day than had started uh, as lead in first round. So the winner in that case, um, the winner took the lead in round six. So next slide, because I want to look at what happened in that one. So there were eight candidates. Um, election was decided in round eight. Candidate A led in the first five rounds, rounds one through five. And then candidate B took the lead in round six. And in that round received more than the more than 50% of the votes cast in that round. So candidate B had uh, 18,561 votes um, uh, out of the total of 34,931 in round six. So the question came up, because I this was this was mentioned in a number of articles about the idea of voter exhaustion. Uh, and it's been hinted at in some of the questions. If you vote for one level, in this case, unless you, you know, had there was a real potential that your, your ballot was gonna um, be exhausted before they got to round six, if you had voted for anyone else besides A and B. So, and in fact, from round one had 39,253 votes, by round six, we were down to 34, 931 votes. So the candidate, so those 18,561 votes in round six were actually less uh, than 50% of the total votes that were in round one. So that's a, a little bit of a quirk of, of how this works. Um, again, of the of all of the of looking at Berkeley, San Leandro, um, Oakland, and San Francisco, um, this was the only one in those elections um, that had a different result than than was in the first round. I also looked at, um, just, in, for, just for saving time, I did not put into the PowerPoint Oakland 2018 or San Francisco 2018, but I did look at that data and it, it was, it was uh, uh, in line with this. So next slide. So then I wondered about, well, was that a fluke? Because um, it was only two years and just four jurisdictions 
So how does it compare nationwide? Um, and nationwide, uh, and this was from the fairvote.org uh, website that's there at the bottom. Um, Fair Vote is an organization that um, focuses on ranked choice voting, is very supportive of ranked choice voting, uh, and has lots of good information on their website. So I do um, recommend that website. Um, so they had, this is nationwide, 289 single winner elections. That means you're voting, you know, only one person wins, it's not multiple people. And they also narrowed that down to only those uh, elections that had at least three candidates, because if you only have two, you're never going to go to a second round. So out of the 289, uh, 120 of those elections, a majority winner was identified in the first round. So that's pretty comparable to what we were seeing in, in our numbers. 20% um, of the election, I mean, I'm sorry, not 20%, 20 of the elections, 20 of the 289 were won by candidates other than the first round leader. So that's 7%, the ranked choice voting process led to a different result. Uh, and in 103 of the elections that went beyond the first round, the ranked choice voting winner did not have a majority of the total votes originally cast. So that 50% threshold does shift and go down a little bit. Uh, over the time. How much it goes down, I think will vary, um, but it does go down a little bit. So um, that's some of the nationwide data. Next slide. Um, in addition to the four uh, Bay Area jurisdictions that currently are in ranked choice voting, there are three uh, additional cities that I found um, have approved um, ranked choice voting systems, Albany, Eureka, and Palm Desert. All of those will begin uh, this year um, with the system. Next slide. So what would it look like in Santa, Santa Rosa? Um, hard to tell, one never knows. But if we look at what I was trying to get at was, so how many would have gone down, gone to second round or third round? Um, in 2018, we had three votes, district two, four, and six. Um, district two and six, um, both uh, were over the 50% limit. Uh, district two only had two candidates. District six only had one candidate. So district four that had three candidates, um, uh, the winning candidate, um, the council member Fleming uh, had 45% out of the three candidates. So that one would have gone to a second round. Next slide. In 2020, um, We had election. one of those districts just had two candidates. That was district three. We weren't gonna go into additional rounds for that. And uh, that was council member Tibbetts uh, one uh, with 99%. Uh, um, so district five um, was over the 50% threshold in, in that single vote. So the two districts, um, district one and district seven District one had four candidates and the winning candidate, council member or vice mayor Alvarez um, had 46%. So that would have gone to a second round and district seven had three candidates and the, that vote was pretty, you know, was split among the three, uh, but council member Rogers uh, had 43%. So districts one and seven would have gone to a second round. We, you know, we have no idea what the result would have been, but just kind of an interesting of would we have gone to uh, additional rounds. Um, and next slide, that's, that's, that's it. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions of Sue right now before we go to public comment and then come back for our discussion? Uh, Chris. Yes, hi. Sorry, Sue, but Scott's comment made me wonder about the assumptions I'm making. So the stat, this current situation is that the candidate with the most votes wins in a multi-candidate race. And if we do nothing, then that's the situation and we don't need to change the charter language or do anything. Is that correct? And there's no legal requirement for a 50.1. No, that's correct. We okay. 
Okay, thanks. Sorry. Okay. Anybody else wanting to ask Sue any questions here? And I am not seeing any. I, I have one. Oh, okay. Didn't see your hand. Oh, there you are, Christine. Oh, yeah, no go worries, for it. no worries. Um, I'm wondering, Sue, I know you provided some awesome resources, but I'm wondering if you could summarize in your own words the pros and the cons of ranked choice voting. Uh, <laughs> Which I know is a lot, and that's like our whole discussion, but I guess I would just right. uh, appreciate hearing from you and the research that you did. Sure. Um, really, the, the, the pros are that, um, I guess where it works best, this may be a little bit roundabout way, I think there should be a quick quick summary of me being able to say what the benefits and the, the pros and cons, but the, the, the where this will work the best is where you have, um, say, three candidates. The example that, that I read in a couple of articles was the Bush v. Gore, and you had Ralph Nader. Nader. If you had had ranked choice voting, Ralph Nader would have been eliminated. He got the fewest votes. His votes would have been transferred. Would they have gone to Gore? Would they have gone to Bush? It could have made a difference in that election. So when you're in that kind of situation, that's where ranked choice voting is gonna have the most impact. Um, so the idea is, um, so that's, that's kind of the, the key benefit. Some of the other benefits are, um, that it is intended to give people a little bit more flexibility in terms of who they are voting for. So you can really vote for who you really want as your first candidate, uh, as your first choice, even though maybe that candidate might be a long shot because you know your vote won't be wasted because your second choice will, will inherit those votes. Um, there is um, also a suggestion that um, it, uh, makes elections more civilized because you don't want to alienate people who might put you down as a second or a third. So you don't want to be as aggressive against potentially the leading candidates because you want to be, um, you, you want to still attract those, potentially attract those voters. Um, the evidence of whether that actually works or not uh, is mixed. Um, Elections right now are pretty animated, um, and so uh, you know the, the evidence is 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 unclear. Um, there are also suggestions that it um, uh, 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 that that it'll it'll help with voter turnout. There are also arguments that no, it'll lower vo voter turnout because of um, it's a, just a new system. It's 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 more complicated. Um, and the cons are, it's potentially more, um, more complicated. Does it suppress votes? Does it really make as much difference as people would hope? Um, you know, when we look at the Bay Area cities, there was only one election out of four jurisdictions. You know, I don't know, if, I don't remember that, you know, 40 elections uh, and it only made a difference in, in, in one. Um, so those are, those are, uh, uh, some of the pros and cons. Um, and I don't know if Diva is still on, uh, if she had some other ideas. So. I think those are a good summary. Of, I don't have anything else to add. Jocelyn. Yes, um, hi Sue. Um, so I just kind of had a quick question. So I remember that last week you touched upon that undocumented to undocumented people could vote. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a presentation maybe next week more about um, more about that because um, I, I feel like it would also help with voter turnout if we were to go down this route. So yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Logan. Sue, do you know how write-in candidates would work under ranked choice voting? Would 
that person be, I guess their name wouldn't be printed. So can you do write-ins or have you run into that in any of those elections? Uh, yes. Or Diva, in, or Diva, either one. Yeah. Sure. And I, and I will say that in a number of the, in a number of the um, elections that I looked at in those four um, Bay Area cities uh, had write-ins and the write-ins, um, you, you do have to be certified. You do have to get approval to be an official write-in. Um, and, um, but the write-ins garner, generally garner so few votes that they are eliminated usually in that first round. So um, it d does not have a, any significant impact that I saw on how things play out in the ranked choice voting. Um, in terms of the ballot, we would continue to have a space for a write-in candidate and then also those same um, ranking options next to them. So a write-in candidate could be ranked as a first choice or a second choice or a third choice, um, just as any other candidate. And I do recognize that there have been elections across the country, and um, I don't remember if there have been any locally, where the write-in candidate has won. Um, not in you know setting aside ranked choice voting, but I do know that that is a possibility. So I didn't mean to minimize the the options of writing voters voting. Okay, thank you, Danny. So I was reading it shows that it's uh, three hundred fifty thousand is what we're estimating to implement the uh, RCV, um, and now I learned that it's uh, just for the software. Do we know what the estimated cost would be for outreach literature and whatnot to the community? And would that include a budget for, to reach out to uh, obviously the BIPOC community and whatnot? I don't know of any budget, but I, I would ask Ms. Pro, Proto. Um, currently um, our, our estimate would be that it would add a dollar to $3 per voter. Um, for an election, but that would be very dependent on what type of outreach um, the city wanted to do because the city would be paying for um, outreach specific to rank choice voting. Okay, and that would, and I was referring to the uh, outreach to educate the community. Is that what you were saying? It adds a dollar? Um, well, that would be, that's our estimate at this point, um, just kind of based on what we would see is kind of the minimum, you know, maybe an extra ballot card uh, with instructions, extra information in the voter information guide, perhaps a couple of postcards, um, but that could be dialed up or dialed down and that would affect the cost. Um, so it would really be dependent on what the city wanted to do. Right now, our best estimate, just based on the fact that we would have to do additional outreach, would be the $1 to $3 for everything, not just outreach, but um, for extra printing costs and paper costs and, and time, that type of thing, as well as education and outreach. Thank you, Diva. Yvette. Yes, uh, I was gonna ask the same thing that Danny asked about the, you know, how would that look going out to, to the public and education because it's complicated now when we do our voting system, and to add something that seems rather complicated to have it go out to the public, that might be that might be a lot of DEI challenges and stuff in that capacity. And then the other thing is, um, can we get some additional data on you, you had last year? I mean, the two elections that we had since we've been in um, a districts. Uh, can we get some additional data of what it looked like previously before we were in districts with the numbers? Because I don't, I can't really see how this would benefit us when we have such, um, now that we're in districts, we don't have huge candidates that, you know, like we don't have eight candidates and I don't see no benefit in delving into something when, if, if we have eight candidates, I could see that working. But since our numbers are like three and two and so forth, it's, I don't see no benefit in that. So maybe taking a look at additional data from previous times, would it, would it look like when we had a whole bunch of candidates running? Um, Adriana. Hi, oh, there I am. Hi, good evening. Sorry, this is more of, 
um, I'm listening in and I think maybe I'm missing some of the answers as some of uh, the committee members are asking their questions. I don't think I heard, what was the response to Ms. Villalobos' um, question? So, re regarding the uh, undocumented? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that if the committee wishes uh, for more information or presentation on that, I'm happy to prepare that and, and provide that. Well, okay, wonderful. I missed that. If you guys said it, I apologize. Thank no, you no, so no. Much. I think I, I think I didn't say it, so yes. Thank you. Okay. okay, any other questions of Sue before we go to uh, public comment and then come back for discussion? Okay, so let's do that. I'm gonna go ahead and open the, the public uh, comment period on this item. And if you're a member of the public uh, wishing to speak on this item, if you're participating by Zoom, please use the raised hand feature. If you're calling in, please dial star nine and the host will recognize you and allow you three minutes to speak. All right, Chair Cisco, I do not see any hands being raised via Zoom from our attendees. And we, sorry, and still no hands. <laughs> okay. <item> 4.2. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and close the public uh, comment period on uh, 4.2. And let's bring it back to the committee um, for discussion. So Scott, you've got your hand up. How about you? Yeah, I, um, a couple things I noted in the material that was handed out that I thought was interesting. It kind of, one of them kind of goes along with uh, uh, Sue the Sue's presentation is the the article where it talked about ranked vote, uh, vote ranked choice in Australia and that 90% of the time with ranked choice, um, the candidate that um, would have won anyway, it didn't change 90% of the time. It didn't change anything. Um, so make an, I'm making a note of that. I'm also a little concerned about the, the other article, the two sides of ranked choice where, where voter fatigue and complexity, that there's an argument that it, it disenfranchises people from, from voting just because of the complexity of it. And so statistically, some of those statistical things showed that to be the case when there was a drop off when you get down into third choice and fourth choice, the number of people just fatigue just goes, I don't know beyond this point who I want to support. Um, I, so, so with both of those, I'm looking at it, this again seems to be sort of a, a solution in, in, in search of a problem to me. Um, um, Yvette said it, we, when we were, if we were talking eight candidates, I could see a point to it. But with the size of our districts, and we're talking two or three candidates, and you look at the cost, I don't, I don't see that as uh, the, the cost benefit is hard for me to, to, to wrap my head around. That's my comment. Karen. Uh, thank you, Patty. I agree with Scott and Yvette. Um, I think um, it's, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? I don't see what the problem is right now in Santa Rosa. Um, we just went to districts. Um, and it's, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, like in the old days where you'd have six or eight people running citywide, um, you know, you have two, three people in a district um, and, it, and the cost. And the, it, but I guess what I keep going back to is how do you explain this to the voting public? I mean, I have watched <laughs> forums on this, I've read on this um, and, I'm still confused <laughs> and granted I have an old brain now, but still um, it just seems, it just seems like it could, um, as Scott said, and I believe Yvette said, disenfranchise people and get people, you know, it's too confusing. I'm not going to vote. Um, so I would not be in favor of going forward with this. Annie. Annie. So, um, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Did you say Annie or Danny? I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I said Danny. Yeah, sorry. Well, yeah. All right. Well, you, um, I read a couple articles that that suggest that it actually helps out with uh, diverse uh, candidates 
um, because the, the uh, it make it makes other candidates reach out to a broader audience, which I think is a positive. Um, my concern is more of the cost of what we're doing. Is it worth it? Um, and and it is complicated to understand. Um, and that's why the outreach to me is important to find out what kind of outreach are we going to do um, to to our broader community, the the Spanish speaking community, most importantly in my case. Uh, but what is that cost of that? And uh, if it's going to cost us, you know, right now three hundred fifty thousand that we're going to look at to implement, does that in the long run save the city money with runoffs, runoffs, and all this other stuff? Um, and how long would it take us to recover that money with the savings that we're going to we're going to do on there? Um, so I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, for me, it would be important uh, to see what kind of outreach we're going to do to the community to educate um, our community members, um, and also the cost uh, to find out it, uh, what we're spending. Are we going to recover that? Chris, thanks. Um, what I what I'm wondering, listening to this, is. Uh, is there a reason to believe that having ranked choice voting would open up the field to diverse candidates or candidates who otherwise might be discouraged from running? Um, and I'm not hearing that. Also, would ranked choice voting avoid the election of someone who really doesn't represent the majority view of the people in their district? And I'm not really hearing that either. So, you know, and I'm not sure that Bush v. Gore is much of an argument for anything really um you know what lessons does one draw um so anyway I'm, I'm hearing it being kind of tepid thanks okay jen hi thanks i'm just gonna add a quick plus one to i don't oh there's my little I, to uh i don't think that we need it now after district elections we don't have that many candidates and so Perhaps later we will have that many candidates and it will become um, more important. But I'm going to agree with Yvette and Scott and everybody, Karen and everyone who followed on that. Thanks. Great. Thanks for the good presentations. Logan. Good discussion, everyone. Thank you for your thoughts. I, this is, um, it's something new. So it's okay that I don't understand it and that most of us don't. Um, I think it is important to remember though, that for basically like the easiest way to explain is it won't change most of the time. Uh, like we saw 90% of the time, the, the round one person wins. And so I think you still have uh, kind of the core of our current system. If you get past 50%, you win. Um, so I think people get that. I, what I wanna pass on from the mayor is some of his thoughts on it. Um, and I think one thing in charter review that we're trying to do that's tough is we're looking forward to, right? Not just back. And so we wanna to try to anticipate problems and you can foresee a scenario where you have a lot of candidates in a district. Um, that doesn't happen yet, thankfully, um, but you know, it, maybe it'll be great when it does. Uh, maybe we'll get a lot of different voices involved and they'll all have you know, something unique to say and I think what the mayor is worried about is that you could have um, people in that process who, you know, under the current system might be a spoiler or might, you know, not be a serious candidate. Um, and so I think what rank choice also does is it, is it forces people to um, look at everyone. And so that's, that's been his thrust is that uh, it'll have more involvement it will prevent that outcome from happening, but it's true, that hasn't happened yet. So that's part of our challenge is trying to predict the future. Um, so I'm gonna support it, but uh, I, I definitely do still have some questions and I, you know, it's gonna be up to the city council ultimately if we approve it. So they get to decide on how they're elected. Um, yeah, so I thanks everyone. This was a good conversation. Ron, how about you? Um. I think that, um, oh goodness, people might think that it's not fair because they don't understand it. They might be skeptical of, I'm talking about the public, might be skeptical of the out, outcome. Um, especially when you put through, when, when the results are posted in the newspaper. Uh, 
And, um, oh, I had one more. Come back to me. I'll, I'll look at it. I made notes of it. You want me to come back to you? Okay. Um, Yvette, I'm going to pass over you just for a second to get to Brian since he hasn't had a chance to talk yet. And then I'll come back to you. Brian. Thanks, Patty. Uh, very quickly, I'm on the leave it as is and not take this on. Um, and I think it, for me, it just the tiebreaker gets, this is educational for me. So I appreciate our conversation tonight, but the tiebreaker for me is we want it as easy as possible to vote. And if a candidate is looking at a ballot and gets confused, the likelihood of them just not voting at all increases. So that's, I guess, the tiebreaker for me to leave it as is. Ron, you ready with what you wanted yes. to? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, the, the, tr traditionally, historically, throughout the country in all of the elections, uh, the down ballot uh, candidates uh, get less attention. And I mean, for instance, in, in the national election, maybe only the president gets uh, uh, the votes for many people. Well, the problem is that if it's as complicated as it is, uh, I think you're gonna have fewer people willing to participate in the down ballot candidates. Okay. Um, Yvette. I see Mark's hand. I don't know if he had a comment. He's before me on the, on the screen. Well, well I'll go first, I'll, Yvette. I'll, I'll, yeah, okay. I'll, go to, I'll get him next. Go ahead, Yvette. Uh, so I just have a clarifying question. So. Um, with the um, the RCV, it would have the candidates would have to be fifty percent plus one, right? So that means we just recently had our election in District One and District Seven. So had this been in place, we would have had to go back and vote again. Uh, no, may I through the chair may I clarify? Yes. So it'll be one ballot and you'll rank each person. So you would rank, uh, you know, candidate A as your first choice, candidate B as your second choice, candidate C as your third choice. And then if your first, if candidate A had the lowest votes, that would be eliminated and the registrar of voters would then count your number, your second choice. So the voter does not need to go back to the ballot at all. It's all okay. in one group. It's all at the registrar of voters where that counting takes place. Okay, because both of those districts was below 50%. So we would have right. automatically went into the um, ranked choice. Right, whoever, okay. it, right. So the one would have been eliminated, the whoever had the lowest votes, whichever candidate had the lowest votes would have been eliminated. There, if those ballots identified a second choice, those votes would go uh, to that second choice. Yeah, and so because based in those two districts, because so thinking back to those districts, uh, district uh, Natalie's district, there was two candidates or three. Pardon, uh, there were three, three or two. Uh, in three. Natalie's district, there were three. Three. It was three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And in district one, there were four. Okay, Mark. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think it's a fascinating topic. My head's a little spinning still, um, but I thought the presentations were very professional. Um, I'm not leaning heavily towards ranked choice voting. I'm probably leaning against it due to potential for confusion and maybe disassociating some vendors or some, some voters, sorry. Um, and then the process for the council appointments for vacant appointments, I think it's something that we should we should fix first um, when we clean up the charter. If it sounded a bit confused in the, during the council meeting, or they go on policy, procedure, ordinance, or, or what, um, and that was uh, that was confusing the folks right there. So maybe we ought to just tighten that up in the charter. Thank you. Okay. Um... Anybody else want to add anything to the discussion? Because I think what we'll do is um, is just 
take tonight an audible vote uh, so that we can kind of complete this thing. I'm hearing um, most of the people that are speaking are against it. So um, if we wanna continue the discussion, let's do that. But at the, at the end of the discussion, I'd like to take an audible vote uh, to see whether we're gonna pass this along to council uh, or not. So Scott, you have something else to say? Yeah, so that's, again, pulling off of what Yvette had mentioned, you know, and, 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 and Logan to a certain extent, say uh, looking forward to the time when there's eight candidates. I know how my mind works on this. I have like a, a higher level. There may be three candidates I'm really interested in, but if I'm doing ranked vote after I go one, two, three, and if there's four, five, six, and seven, and they're all the same, then I'm just randomly putting numbers on them or I'm not voting. And so I think I think some of the stuff it, it, it shows by the number of people that drop off because I'd be afraid to vote for someone I don't really feel strongly about, you know. And I, and that's, I think that's a that's a downside to to the ranked choice. Okay, um, Ron, you have more to say. I would like to know how do what the, the difference in the prices. Of the old system versus this system. The cost to the voters, to the public. I don't know if Ms. Provo is still on. Um, through the chair, would you like me to respond? Yeah, it, yeah okay. and I think if not, maybe it we is. could access her presentation because I think that had yeah. that, it was like. It is, yep. yes, it is in okay. there. So um, the um, current election for a district election is three to six dollars per voter. The ranked choice voting would add another dollar to one to three dollars per voter per election. So it's a, you know, in, in, instead of it being three to six, it could be six to nine, up to six to nine. Thank you. That's that's great. And then, so that's the election process, um, just the, the election cost estimate. And then um, as Ms. Proto uh, indicated, you know, we'd have the startup cost of the 350, the annual cost of the um, 70,000 annual fee, and then the printing and ballot, um, printing and educational materials cost as well. But currently, um, the a district election is between three and six dollars um, per voter, and that number changes depending on how many measures are on the ballot and how many. Um, is, so that's that's what affect. That's why it's a range depends on what else is on the ballot. Actually, I was thinking about um, the total cost as opposed per as opposed to per uh, voter because we've got other. Uh, costs that we're going to have to be considering over the next few months. Um, so do you have any idea? First, last year, uh, compared to last year, uh, what what would the difference in the prices have been, to, uh, uh, the total cost? Um, I, I think that those, those numbers um, are pretty similar to what they were before. I'd have to do, if I did a quick calculation, um, you know, it would be, you know, the prior cost would have been, let's say, let's average to 10,000 voters in the district would have been, um, you know, between, boy, if I'm going to do my math right, 10,000 times three, 30,000 to 60,000 um, uh, for each district election, it would now be between um, 60 and 90,000. And don't we have to consider all the rest of the costs? Right, and I don't of the have income yeah. of the city. Yeah, I don't have the cost of all the other associated mm -hmm. increases. I don't have that those dollar figures. Okay, it's a big increase. Yeah, Chris, you have another comment? Uh, yes, just to very briefly pile on. Um, I think also the very concept of ranked choice voting as a decision-making tool to me is troublesome because I think that by its nature, it gives the most power or weight 
to the voters who by definition supported the least supported candidate in the field and therefore can lead, I think, to results that uh, do not reflect the majority of the will of the voters, um, but that's just piling on. Okay. Anybody else have, it? Ernesto? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I really don't have anything to add. I think a, a lot of uh, good points have been made by those that uh, See, this is not a place for us to be going to right now, and I would support that. So I'm ready for a vote. Okay. Okay, well, unless somebody else has something to say, what I'd like to do is, um, uh, Ms. Williams, have you, you know, call an audible vote so we can kind of see where we are on this and where we're going. So if you could do that, that would be great. Okay, and I will just take a tally and I will start at the bottom of my roll call. Okay. Starting with member Weeks. Um, I'm not in favor of ranked choice voting. Member Walsh. I'm not in favor. Member Villalobos. Um, against. Member Pitts. In support. Member Oliveras. No. Member Minor. Absolutely not. <laughs> Member Miller. No. Member Mazia. Not in favor. Member Martinez. Support. Member Ling. No. Member Close. Not at this time. Member Diaz? I'm not in favor. Member Cunningham? I'm not in favor. Member Condren? Not at this time. Member Byrne? For it. Member Bartley? Not in favor. Member Badenford? Yes, I'm with the not at this time. Member Barber? Not at this time. Member Arizon? Not in favor. And Chair Cisco? Um, I'm also not in favor at this time. So, so my tally, um, Sue, shows uh, three in support and 17 not in support. Okay. So with that, um, I'd like to, uh, when we give our report to uh, the city council report um, that the committee by these numbers uh, is not in support of putting this on the ballot at this time. So anything else on this before we move to the next item? Okay. All right. And again, thanks to, to Ms. Proto for, for taking her time to, to do this presentation. So our next item is uh, committee chairs, city attorneys report. So Sue, anything to report? Uh, no, I don't have anything to report. And neither do I. Um, we have no subcommittee reports, no written or electronic communications. Um, we have a little bit more work to do um, on our future agenda items. Um, I think uh, what, what Sue and I were planning with this is that we would go through um, our remaining list of items that the council gave us. Um, this might be a time to, to add your preference in if there's something else that you want the committee to be taking up. Am, am I correct about that, Sue? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. So um, does, does everybody have a copy of what our um, remaining items are? Okay, let me, I got some questions happening here. So um, Brian, got a question? Uh, just a future item. Um, last week, 
the uh, selection by the council for the appointment, the open appointment for the Tibbetts district, um, it, it just got messy after the first two rounds. And my recollection is when Dick Dowd was appointed, what, three years ago, it was the same, kind of got messy the third or fourth round. Uh, and maybe uh, I think at least Ernesto was on council at that point. It, it feels like it's something that needs reviewed. And at that council meeting, they referenced that if there was going to be a change in that process, it had to come from here. So um, maybe that's just something that uh, council can comment on. It doesn't have to be right now, but it might be something we want to look at. So do you have um, any response to that? Sure, I'm, I'm happy um, to respond. Yes, it's been um, both this time and the, the just the last time um, have been uh, not the cleanest uh, process. Um, but I do wanna clarify that what's in the charter is the charter gives the council the choice of you can appoint someone or you can call a special election. If you appoint someone then uh, that person serves until the next general election. So Ms. McDonald will serve until next, until certification of the November election. Um, that's all that's in the charter. Um, I, I believe the charter also provides that the council can provide additional procedures. So it's a council policy that sets forth that elimination system that they've used, that they used back both uh, last time and this time, um, but that's by council policy. It's a resolution that the council can adjust. Um, I do think um, it would be worth the council looking at that policy and considering if there should be some changes to it. Um, again, it does provide for very specific um, process of the number of votes that are cast each round, how the votes are counted. Um, uh, you do need to get to four votes to take any council action. So that's, that's the threshold. Um, but in terms of a charter amendment, the charter just simply states you can either appoint uh, or you can uh, call a special election. If this committee wants to consider uh, whether to adjust that language, uh, maybe to require um, that the council call a special election. Um, you know, we could certainly uh, consider that. So there that are answers, pros yeah, that answers my question. My concern was on the, the ultimate selection process, not which way we should go. So okay. we'll, we'll keep it off our agenda. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yvette, you have a question? Yeah, it's, it was in regards to the same thing. I was one of the 19 that was going for Julie Cohn's seat and that process was really tough. And so I know Sue stated that it was an ordinance or resolution. I, uh, is there any way possible that this information can go back to the city council for us to take a look at that? Because I have a fear that this is not the only time, this is within a four um, year period that we've had to do this process. And it's, it's a possibility real soon that we might have to do it again. And so it's gonna, it's, I hear a lot of flack that comes from the community when the process is not done right. So I think, you know, that is something we really should take a look at and, uh, and delve into that a little bit more to really clarify and get the voting down. Cause it, it, it almost seemed like the ranked choice voting that is like what they were doing for that. And so we really need to make sure that the community feel like we're getting a fair shake when it comes to picking the next council member. And it doesn't feel that way every time we have one of these um, elections that go on. So um, I don't know what would be the next step for that, but I definitely would want to have conversation about um, it. So you want me to respond? Yeah, what, what would we do with that? Sure, what I would suggest is that, you know, maybe the, this committee, it's not within the realm of this committee to decide the resolutions of the council, but it would certainly be this, the committee could decide to give that message to the council uh, that this committee feels that the um, council should re-examine that, the existing policy and consider revisions to that policy. 
So we could make that at the cl conclusion of our, um, the, the work that we're doing in mending the charter, we could make right. it as part of the report that we hand off that the committee would like this taken up. Is, is that yeah. a method we could use? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Logan. Um, Sue, can you talk about what you envision being in the omnibus ballot measure? Uh, sure. Um, I don't have it all pinned down yet, so this is just kind of preliminary. Um, one is uh, that we will be looking at um, some changes to procurement uh, procedures that are set forth in the, um, uh, in the charter to streamline some of our internal pro processes. Um, we're looking at whether there's some, as a charter city, whether we can uh, carve out um, some exceptions to state law, we're looking at that. But those all have to do really with kind of our internal procurement um, procedures. Um, I'm also anticipating that we will be um, looking at um, eliminating some of the provisions in the charter that are simply no longer relevant. Um, they don't have to come out, but they're not relevant. Um, we have con uh, you know, provision about school districts and there's I think one or two others that just simply are no longer applicable. Um, we'll also be looking at what I thought I would bring back to the committee when we look at the omnibus bill is the proposal that council made to consider a two year budget um, that's not technically within the omnibus bill, maybe, maybe not, um, but I figure that's kind of a procedural, internal procedural issue um, that would be appropriate to discuss at that time. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the others, um, you know, maybe I'll bring back a little bit more discussion on the, on the vacancy just to kind of pin that down. Uh, but those are the things that are in, in, on my list right now. Okay. Can you, yeah. Can you help us understand why all that can fit into one ballot measure? Why, why is it that, uh, I mean, I guess someone could sue us, but in, in your legal opinion, why would that pass legal muster? Uh, because they will be all internal, particularly if it depends on, on what all gets included. I realize that there, there, there are going to be some boundaries as to what might have to be carved out. Um, but to the extent that it can be about kind of cleanup of the charter uh, to streamline procedures uh, and to eliminate unnecessary provisions. I think we can do that all on one ballot. The other element I'm sorry that I should have mentioned is that we are gonna need to look at um, um, bringing the charter in line with district elections. I actually do not see that as being able to be part of the omnibus bill. Um, maybe I could be talked into it, but I think that's gonna need to be a separate uh, ballot to confirm uh, that uh, to confirm the the district elections. Okay, just one last thing. If you could find another example of an omnibus charter okay. amendment, that that'd be helpful, to just so okay. I can understand what other cities have done. Sure, and I can also bring. Um, uh, we've done it uh, the last several years, so I can bring back what was included in those um, those measures in the past as well. So. And we'll think about a better name, like the buffet table or you yeah. know, appetizer <laughs> spread, something like that other than on the bus. Yes, yeah. um, and I appreciate any suggestions on that because um, uh, you know I just took that from kind of what gets used in the in the legislature, and it's it's not a readily understandable um, uh, term. So yeah, okay, thanks a lot, Karen. Thanks, Patty. Um, I do have a couple things um, uh, that when reading the, reading through the charter, um, the term citizen is used and I think maybe that needs to be revised or I know that needs to be revised to something else like resident. Um, I um, can't remember if we talked about this last time, but talking about changing the review cycle for the charter, um, so it doesn't coincide with the um, census. I mean, actually, the way it's written now, because um, it says no, I think no, no has to occur at least every ten years. So I think it's okay language now, but it just would be a matter then of when we submit information to the council to say these are the things that we would like 
to occur even if the language doesn't change. Um, and then a uh, community advisory board is in the charter. Uh, I don't know if it needs to be. It's uh, other than Board of Public Utilities, I think it's the only board that's in the charter. Um, and so I think that that needs to be looked at. Uh, and then also I know we, we reviewed early on um, the items that could only be accomplished via the charter versus those that could be done via ordinance. And so I'd like to maybe revisit that list. Um, and uh, so we only have a couple more items on the things that can only be done by the charter. Um, also in the charter, they use the terms his and her. And so I think that that needs to be updated. Um, and then anything about campaign finance changes now that we're in districts, I don't know if people have thought about that or not. So those are just some things that I've been thinking about. Uh, Mark. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I would. I would be in favor of defining the process that the council uses to fill the vacancy. So right now in the charter, it's either or. Um, the council can either leave leave the vacancy alone until the general election or make the appointment. If we're going to include making the appointment, I, I think I think that, that we should know how, how that appointment will be made. Um, and then I agree with Logan that if we're going to have an omnibus bill that uh, we rename it buffet and, and uh, put in all else. Those are the, the, the two items. With respect to the two-year budget process, um, it's possible we may want to spend some time on reviewing what actually, what, what parts of the charter are actually implemented now and, and what aren't. Um, there may be some finance things that, that haven't been implemented because they're too complicated and they're out of date um, and, um, and they really don't serve us well. So I'd be interested in looking at the budget, what they mean by, I don't know, um, budget all funds. I would kind of clean that up because it would be difficult to implement for, uh, for anybody. I think we ought to clean that up to help staff. Thank you. Anna. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm kind of surprised that nobody, I'm sure I'm not the only one that got that email, um, I want to say last week, but um, I want to say it was by Gregory Fearon. Um, going off by what Yvette was saying earlier, um, I mean, if that's what the public is saying, and you know, community members are probably coming together and speaking about this topic, I think that it is important for us to speak about, especially when it was an email sent to all of us. And then also, um, I wanted to make sure, are our recordings being posted on YouTube? Because I have had a couple members of a, the community ask um, what the easiest way to um, actually process these videos and um, maybe somebody from the city, um, from the city review um, charter um, committee also want to watch the videos um, as well. So um, I, I did notice that other um, YouTube videos of other committees are being posted. So I just wanted to clarify that. And so I can answer that part, um, Anna. Um, our IT um, person did post those on YouTube after I received your email, he was going to post those. But just so you know, that is not our official portal. All of the videos are on the city charter web portal, the videos, the minutes, and the agendas, that is our official archive. And YouTube is not considered an official archive. If the YouTube chooses to take those down, we don't have any recourse to have them put it back up because it is not considered our official archive. But after your email, I did ask him to um, upload those to YouTube. So they should be there, but they are, um, all of the videos are on the meeting portal for all of our boards and commissions where all our board and commissions um, videos, agendas, and minutes are um, posted. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. uh, Danny. So I'm in favor also of uh, reviewing the appointing process of the city council members um, because it seemed like it was a debacle when it did kind of reflect the RCV that we've all been complaining about earlier today. Um, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to see if we can talk about on the charter review 
is section nine for staff for the city council. Um, as we already are talking about making sure that they're compensated right and properly. I know the workload is, is pretty heavy for the city council members. So I wanted to see if we can maybe review about uh, staff for the city council and uh, make some adjustments to that, uh, to the charter review that was set. Also uh, section 10 of the charter review, uh, uh, number one says city council shall establish each year an allocation for public improvements within each district, um, at, you know, um, which the district representative after a notified public hearing can determine where that, those funds are spent. I'd like to, I have more for more questions um, on that area, specifically how is that um, calculated? Do the council members even know that that's there for them? Um, when is it available? Um, all the criteria that are not in, in uh, number one, I think we need to know that. And I think that if we know and the, and the council members uh, understand what's available to them, instead of thinking that it's a handout versus it's what's owed to them, it could help the community really thrive in knowing what's available to each council member um, under uh, section 10, number one. Sue, can you respond to that? What section 10 is about? Section 10, I have to pull up my, my, my charter. Um, section 10 is, a, I believe is with the, um, with the cab money. I believe it's it the is. cab money. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's the cabs community improvement grants that they um, allocate every year. And then they bring those to council for approval once they um, make the, that grant award to the different um, quadrants and um, associations, but it is through the cab grants. Yeah. So it's not money that the individual council members have to spend within their districts. Correct. And I will note also that at this point, the cab districts are not aligned with the council districts, uh, but the council has indicated its intent to, uh, to align those. So. Um, Sue, so I know uh, we were hoping to maybe um, prioritize the next set of um, items so that you could begin to prepare presentations. But I'm wondering, um, rather than do that tonight from the existing list of the city council, um, if we could uh, incorporate some of these suggestions, have a new list, but also have in front of us, because some of the things on the list from the city council, um, kind of like the appointment process or handled in policy or handled in ordinances so that the committee has a real clear understanding of um, what's in place now. Um, and then um, and then what we could do as the committee, we could go again, an audible vote, give me your top three and we'll find the top three, kind of a ranked choice voting thing. Um, does that sound okay, or do you do you have a different feeling about what we should do with? Um, I, I think that's fine. I guess my only concern is that um, we're, with the the calendar that um, that I proposed, and it was just a proposal, um, is that we would start to deal with we would start to address the committee's next priority uh, at our March sixteenth meeting. Mm -hmm. um, if we wait until our March second meeting to get that direction, that gives us a very short period of time. Um, it gives us one week to pull materials together. So okay. um, we, we, can, we can work with that. Um, and and I, do under, I do recall that we were gonna, I was gonna provide, and I'm sorry I didn't to do that, um, as to what is left on the council's list that could be done by ordinance versus what needs a charter uh, amendment. So, yeah, because uh, some of those things we, we're already talking about, including in an omnibus thing. And I just think for clarity's sake, I mean, I realize it starts to put us up against a crunch, but um, we can, yeah, I can, I can do that. And, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just be, we'll, we'll, we'll make some educated guesses and start preparing a couple of things. And um, okay. so that we, we can be on, on board for the, for both the second and the 16th. So, okay, so, so maybe we can start with that before we move on to um, the council compensation and um, 
because we don't need to do any proposed ballot language for at large or ranked choice voting. Um, right. And then we can do the presentation on the omnibus, which may help sort of narrow down the list that we have. Is, is that right? Is that, is that okay with everybody? <laughs> I'm trying to make sure we and can handle I'll this. Think of, of a new name so that we can yeah. <laughs> find a new name, name for and Logan. A new <laughs> proposed schedule. So, okay. Um, and so, yes, we'll do yeah. the. Okay. Yeah. I just don't want us to go through the exercise of prioritizing something when we don't really know whether it's right. already been handled or whatever. So if you're if you're right. okay with that, I think that that would be a better way to handle it is just okay. start with that prioritization with some of what we've got here and and that list of things that have been handled by ordinance. Um, okay. Okay. I will do that, and I'll also mention that a couple of the things that were uh, mentioned um, by by committee members were things that. Um, I neglected to mention, but are I was considering as part of the omnibus measure again whether they end up all in one, right? Um, the separate question, but at least that we would be considering them, and particularly the timing of uh, of charter review. So right, right, and then um, and we need to get a question uh, answered as to the potential for uh, voting um, uh, non. Citizen voting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Have a, have a bit more information on that yeah. for the benefit of the committee. So. Yeah. Okay. Um. Anything else on that, Sue? Any other no. questions? Okay. I do have to do um. Ask for public comment on this item. So I'm going to go ahead and open the public comment on this last item or future agenda items. If you are participating by Zoom, uh, use the raised hand feature. If you're dialing in uh, by phone, dial star nine and the host will recognize you to speak for three minutes. Chair Cisco, I'm not seeing any hands be raised via Zoom. Okay, that's great. Um, so, with that, I think we are, unless anybody has anything to add, <laughs> we're safe to adjourn. And I'll go ahead and adjourn this evening's meeting uh, to meet again on March the 2nd. And again, thank you all. So. Thank you, Chair. Take care.